hello everyone uh, and uh, welcome to new wave media i am joined by dr danish khan who is a professor at franklin and marshall college uh, east coast in the united states danish is a thoughtful academic uh, a prolific writer and also somebody who engages in public discourse both within pakistan and here in the US. So Danish, thank you for joining me. Uh, we are going to be talking about this particular moment, uh, which I have been personally trying to make sense of, and that is the rise of populism across the globe, and how far is it being uh, underwritten or uh, facilitated by the neoliberal order or the inequities that we face uh, across the globe, and we would uh, talk about uh, the world, but then we, of course, are from Pakistan. So we are going to throw some spotlight on what is happening in Pakistan, where a populist leader has successfully uh, gripped public imagination, has divided the key institutions uh, of the state. Uh, either they, some of them are for him or against him. And we shall try and make sense of this very complicated reality. Thanks, Danish. And uh, tell, tell us and, and the viewers, how do you perceive this particular moment that we are witnessing across the globe? You know, you have Trumpism in the United States, you have Modi in India, you have Erdogan in Turkey, you have, you know, the Philippines had a, uh, and Bolsonaro in, in Brazil who's lost the election, but, you know, he garnered millions of votes. Yeah. So, and then of course we have Imran Khan in Pakistan, uh, now, of course, they all are different. I'm not saying they are cut from the same cloth, but they all have a particular brand of personal charisma and appeal and populist rhetoric that is making them really invincible. Yeah. Thank you, Raza Saab. Uh, glad to be here. So as you rightly said, and I also want to underscore at the outset that there are internal heterogeneities and diversity within a wide range of socio-political and cultural movements within the umbrella of what we call the right-wing populism. Um, so in other words, the right-wing populism in some ways an abstraction, right? That can manifest in different forms across uh, time and space. So as you mentioned in America, it may manifest in the form of rise of Trump, in India, in the form of Moody, in Brazil, Paul Serrano, and in Pakistan to an extent, Imran Khan. But one major underlying current across the right-wing populism is that it is a response to establishment-centric politics, or again, in Pakistan, establishment means something else, but just for our global viewers, it's more like a response to radical centrist policies of the past three decades, especially in North America and Europe. So as we can see, the center of political spectrum is falling apart, right? I mean, they, it has been, been on attack from both left and right, but it is, again, either moving towards right or somewhat towards left. Unfortunately, not much towards left. So, so if we take a historical route, right, to understand how did we end up here. So uh, during the Cold War, and in particular, uh, since the post-World War II up till 1980s, uh, what scholars call the golden age of capitalism in Western countries. And it was predicated on the Keynesian welfare state policies, mm. which created a class compromise between the working classes and the capitalist class. Of course, there were geostrategic factors at play as well. For example, uh, it can be argued, and again, some scholars have argued that the development of welfare state at the first place in Europe in North America was a response to the external threat of communism to, uh, for the lack of better word, to liberal democratic capitalism, right? Now, what do I mean by liberal democracy here? It is, well, it ensures some sort of rights for minority, some sort of rights for uh, ethnic religious minorities and uh, pluralism in the sense that there's a space for dissent within the legal order, right? But as we notice, as this threat, external threat faded away with the fall of Berlin Wall and the collapse of Soviet Union, uh, the welfare state came under attack in the West, right? Now, 
So when we see this, uh, the decline of the threat of, from the external front, we also see some internal contradictions. For example, in, in 70s, as you probably read, in the US, there was high inflation and a lot of labor militancy, which led to profit squeeze for capitalist class. So when both of these factors combine, the, the decline of external threat and uh, internal contradiction or crisis deepened, uh, there was a moment for neoliberal ideologues to take over. And that's the rise of the neoliberalism, which meant that state policies of uh, subsidies or social safety net for working classes were withdrawn and everything was left to the market and everything was supposed to be commodified, right? And that, this created huge profits for big corporations and businesses, in particular, the finance capital. As a result, socioeconomic inequality increased rapidly in Western countries and across the world. And, and these policies were largely mimicked in countries of the global south with, of course, their own local variation. But 2008 financial crisis became a tipping point where working classes and middle classes faced massive unemployment, lost their homes, while top 1% um, got away with their reckless policies and in fact further uh, increased their wealth. So inequality further uh, increased. So regular people in the US across Europe felt disillusioned and got angry with the existing system. And this has translated into populist movements, both at the right and left, but again, left seems less of a threat to liberal democracy. It's a more the right-wing populism, which seems as a uh, really big threat to liberal democracy because left-wing populism is more about inclusive. It doesn't attack minorities. It doesn't attack uh, civic liber liber liberties. Instead, it's the right-wing populism which has created a tripartite structure in the US and across the world, you'll notice. So on the top, there's an enemy, enemy number one, which is sitting at the top. And these are like liberal elites in the form mm. of Wall Street yeah. or big corporations. And then at the bottom, there's another enemy. These are immigrants, working class communities. In the US, it's Hispanic, Mexican communities, or even at times, ethnic minorities like Jews, Muslims, all being portrayed as, as the enemies. And in the middle, there's a virtuous middle class, or which is often white or in the Europe, in the framed as the native population, right? So they have been squeezed from top and bottom. That's the discourse of the right-wing populism. So, and why it is an internal threat to liberal democracy? Because it, although it advocates majority rule and popular sovereignty at the, while undermining minority rights, separation of power and plurality of political and economic perspectives, right? So this is, the broad context in which I see the global uh, rise that's of really, populism. Yeah. That's really well explained, <clears throat> Danish. And uh, <clears throat> and I think, uh, you know, let's uh, talk a bit about the US first and then uh, move on to our other two areas of interest, Pakistan and India. But I think in the United States also what we are, I mean, Trumpism is part ideological, but in... Uh, uh, in many uh, ways, it is also a reflection of these post-2008 financial crises, uh, you know, inequities. And uh, I think the income and wealth inequality perhaps has never been worse uh, for a century in the United States. And that is, uh, many uh, ascribe uh, to that. But there is something uh, more to it, and that has to do with the kind of personal personality Charisma as well. I mean, the, you know that that populist uh, stuff that you know, let's say Trump stands for, and DeSantis in Florida is, is is struggling hard to copy that or ape that. So, talk a bit about that. I mean, what kind of politics is that? Yeah, I think that's a good point. So again, uh, I would I would agree that we cannot reduce the uh, the rise of right wing populism to simply economic inequities. Of course, they play a central role, and I think the most important role, but there's also a role of ideology and the role of, as what you said, the strong man, right? So, and, and, and the strong leader. And Trump manifests that in a, in a, in a, in a society where, uh, again, toxic masculinity uh, mm. combined with 
you know the the success right he he brags about his success as a business person right and as as somebody who did well and so that also appeals to his uh, base but if if you see why Trump personality is uh, attractive is is again tied to again socioeconomic inequities and other important issues so i think i can divide into three core issues mm. what trump and generally right wing populists stands for in in the global north and one is immigration right so they pose immigrants as a threat to native population right they feel that immigrants are taking away their jobs so again and that's where trump again as a white male successful business person he kind of he he alludes he appeals to some way to um, white supremacists, but again, not all his voters are racist. It's there are some. Exactly. Uh, we, we noticed that um, there are some who are more inclined towards Trump because of his rhetoric on, let's say, against globalization or free trade policies. Right. So they are more interested in getting their jobs back. And the third factor is more about the cultural grievance as as again you live around college campus as well and also teach so you know there's so much discourse against liberal arts totally colleges and universities in the u.s about race wars even where i live there's a huge debate uh, on elementary school curriculum whether they feel like kids have been indoctrinated with radical leftist ideology and which is nonsense i mean to to tell young children about the uh, injustices of the past right that's not any way radical theory in fact that should be done um, but that these are i think the broad uh, broad contours yes. yes so let's let's take let's shift uh, about eight nine thousand miles <laughs> and go to south asia you know the the region of our interest and origin and of, obviously we care about that and let's start uh, with uh, Modi in India. I mean, you know, uh, we do know now that uh, Mr. Modi's uh, politics, while it is couched and in, uh, in very religious, uh, you know, religious nationalist uh, rhetoric, has effectively supported uh, big billionaires, has created many billionaires, has uh, you know unleashed a. Uh, unadulterated neoliberal order in India, and the case of Adani, uh, you know, which has been in the news, is I mean that nexus is very clear. So, how far do you think uh, uh, the case of India is also the Hindutva movement, or what is the Hindu nationalist uh, movement, is a reflection of these? uh economic uh, uh you know uh, grievances and inequities yeah i mean i i want to foreground that i am i feel less comfortable talking about india right again i feel like i'm more mm -hmm. um uh i yeah it's okay the case of pakistan. yeah understand the case of pakistan and let's start with pakistan yes yeah, yeah sure, okay. sure so but i will just comment like uh, in the case of Moody's India, we also uh, see the similar trend, right? Where ethnic minorities, in particular religious minorities, especially Muslims, have been stigmatized, right? And it, and they have been scapegoated as uh, as anti-India or anti-national nationalist in the case of Indian state. And similarly, as you mentioned, the uh, freedom of press has been under attack. We recently saw BBC's offices were raided um, because they did a documentary on Moody. So, again, and similarly, the elite networks uh, or elites are cozy with Moody. So that's uh, so we see a lot of similar things going on in India as compared to the rest of the world uh so anyway let's move to pakistan and where where we see this kind of populist rhetoric by imran khan which is completely now i think uh, imran khan has successfully uh you know um influenced uh, many generations uh, living both in pakistan and abroad and you know they kind of take every word that he says very seriously and think that you know he has all those solutions or he, he's even the messiah like like Mr. Trump, for example, mm -hmm. or other examples. So 
elaborate that a bit, how far it is linked. And I think the right wing label on Pakistan is a bit problematic because everybody's right wing, all, almost right wing, near right wing, to wanna be right wing, close mm -hmm. to right wing. So, yeah. so you know, in Pakistan, it's, a, it's, it's all a game of one particular type of politics, you know. But within that, Imran Khan obviously is on more on the right, you know. Yeah, sure, sure. Anyway. I, yeah, I think it's a fair point that uh, it would not be, uh, it would not make much sense to just uh, impose that abstraction of right-wing populism to explain Pakistani politics because the equilibrium of the society is way towards right. So almost everyone seems like right, right? And, and that is true. And moreover, Pakistan was never uh, a liberal democracy in the in the in a sense of the L with the capital L, right? That liberal. Instead, it aspires or it borrows some key tenets of liberal democracy, such as separation of power, um, freedom of press and freedom of expression with huge qualifications and caveats. Again, freedom of religion, again, that's with huge caveat there. But the multi-party parliamentary democracy, that has been one of the defining features of uh, constitutional democracy in Pakistan. So historically, it was the military establishment that has been the major threat or challenge to Pakistan's multi-party parliamentary democracy, right? And therefore, the democratic movement has been to curtail military establishment, the role of military establishment in politics, and to strengthen multi-party parliamentary democratic system, or to promote pluralism. Now, Imran Khan is a unique challenge because it's an internal challenge to uh, this multi-party parliamentary democracy. And, uh, and as you mentioned, he also brags about his personal achievements in the same way as Trump talks about his wealth and personal achievements. So this strongman leadership narrative and appeal that Imran Khan has, so it has his own persona, but I, again, as a, as a, social scientist, I try to stipulate some underlying socio-institutional and economic factors to explain. So I've come up with like four broad explanations why Imran Khan's persona has been so effective, right? So for sure, he's out there. He offers a unique personality type. But what have been the underlying uh, factors in the society that has made his persona very attractive? So first is Again, the institution of patronage, a lot have been written about it. But what I want to underscore is that the lack of grassroots socio-political organizations, such as student unions or the community organizations where people could have come together as a collective to solve their problem at, at, at the level of community or at the level of society. Now, these organizations, especially labor unions or student unions, have been eliminated by state policies. Instead, it's the institution of political patronage that have been developed, where politics is reduced to transactions. That is, you give me votes, and I, as a local influential, will give you road, street lights, or a job, possibly, right? So it created a system where local patrons, again, few powerful individuals at the local level, they come out as a savior of the disadvantaged masses. So this has resulted into uh, discouragement towards collective action and reliance on strong local patron. So that one, one factor. Second is the institution of charity has become huge in Pakistan. So in, and uh, and that is social charity where one or few privileged individuals, right? Again, we assume them to be benevolent who come for the help of the disadvantaged. As a result, the reliance on collective action and more importantly, the belief that collective action by the people can lead to any positive change has been replaced by uh, hope for a, some strong person and individual to come for their help to as a savior. And third is the absence of critical thinking in our education institution and again, other institutions as well, uh, where it does not promote any kind of critical social science scholarship. So as a result, as you have noticed, even the university educated young people in Pakistan, 
uh, do not necessarily even know that there are multiple political and economic perspectives that can help us explain the underdevelopment of Pakistan. Um, and therefore, whenever they hear a simplistic discourse of that few individuals, in other words, these dynastic families are the, are the real culprits, they tend to believe it. So here, the lack of exposure to multiple perspective is, is a major issue because when you get exposed to multiple perspective, uh, it allows you to appreciate that no claim, right? No political, social, or economic claim is complete or perfect. They are partial uh, explanations. And this makes you humble and it makes you uh, willing to listen to others because they may have something to offer. And, and we see this completely eroding in Pakistan right now where um, folks believe that they know the absolute truth. Pakistan is poor because of one or two individuals. And the third, uh, sorry, the fourth is, again, a very important point, and that is directly tied to the established political parties, right? And here, I'm, I'm not simply referring to the to PPP or PMLN or other parties being dynastic. Of course, being dynastic is an issue, but I'm going beyond that. I'm saying their reluctance or inability to innovate with the changing times. Uh, for example, uh, the new generation of PPP and PMLN, which manifest in the form of, let's say, Bilawal Bhutto or Maryam Nawaz, uh, they have been unable to define their own political stance, like what they stand for, for in the realm of social economic issues, such as what, what they have to offer to address the issue of inequality, climate change, rights of minorities, and so forth. So whether one agrees or disagrees with their parents' generation, um, but they did stand for something, right? For example, Zulf Kalari Bhutto came up with more leftist populist narrative of uh, uh, socialism, whereas Nawaz Sharif and Benazir uh, championed liberalization of economy, right? One can critique their policies, but at least they offered some sort of agenda. Whereas whenever Bilawal and Maryam try to offer something more universal, such as whenever they become critical of military establishment, they do get positive response from people across segment of the society. But in Pakistan, it's not just about military establishment. There are other political, economic, and cultural issues. So in other words, is Bilawal socialist? Is Maryam social democrat? Or if all of them are right-wing populist or not, Populists, if they all stand for similar things like neoliberal ideology and um, just reliance on IMF or patronage politics, then of course Imran Khan becomes more popular alternative because, well, he also stands for same thing, neoliberalism, but he has that something else to offer, no dynastic legacy. And being a charismatic ex-cricketer and ex-celebrity. Therefore, he captures the imagination of young people. So I think collectively these four factors, and again, the demographic shift in Pakistan has been talked a lot about, uh, that plays a key role. But I think these four institutional factors and socioeconomic factors collectively led to the rise of Imran Khan as an autocratic populist, let me say, rather than the right wing. Yes, exactly, exactly. Very, very... Uh, well summarized, and I think so. So, what's the way forward then? How do you deal with these situations and these moments? I mean, you know, you should let. Of course, we know it's a historical process. All these four factors you've uh, mentioned uh, uh, have contributed to this uh, current uh, impasse, if I may call it that. So, where do we go from here? We let this play out, or? Uh, do political forces need to do something? Or, I mean, you know, uh, some commentators in Pakistan say the, you know, the permanent establishment, i.e. the military uh, needs to step in. I mean, all of these, uh, these things to me are not going to help at all. Yeah, for sure. And again, uh, it's uh, because the, there's so many uh, uh, other factors at play, right? So is uh, it's not just about PTI. What about the actual really militant religious populists like TLP and others? They're also there, right? So it's a 
it's a really complicated story. So again, at, at the moment, the minimum we can expect is that the existing form of multi-party parliamentary democracy, if, uh, if that's the goal, right, if that is the minimum we want to continue with, of course, for then uh, I think the political power needs to be dissipated across multiple civilian stakeholders. And by that, I mean the political parties, because historically we have seen, even in the case of uh, PMLN, when in late 90s it got overwhelming majority, they have a tendency of being autocratic, undermining the separation of power between uh, different institutions, right? So therefore, uh, it is important that the, these uh, mainstream political parties to move more towards uh, uh, probably left, in my opinion, to offer something concrete to working classes, to middle classes, to young people, right? Go beyond the discourse of the their past achievements or the sacrifices their parents or grandparents made, right? I, I respect that, right? Sure, they have played a good role, but that's not enough, right? So we they want us to sympathize and relate with them. Now it is their time to sympathize and relate with the working people of Pakistan, young people of Pakistan. And in order to do that, I think the issue of economic inequality, climate change, uh, employment, and quality healthcare and education, gender equality, all of these right, uh, should become part and parcel of their uh, economic discourse, or sorry, their political discourse. But one concerning thing is that historically, judiciary has been the key stakeholder that tends to curb the excesses of the state and executive, right? And it stands up for the rights of the average citizen, and especially the disempowered one. But it, as you, you know better, the recent note or judgment by uh, Justice Atharmanullah really brilliantly talked about that the lack of concern shown by the judiciary towards the, let's say, the folks who have been disappeared or who faces the excesses of the state. Instead, judiciary seems more concerned with the issues of the political elite. So, so in that sense, I think there's a uh, important tipping point for Pakistani state that not just political stakeholders, such as mainstream political parties, move more towards emancipatory politics, right? Incorporate disempowered segments of the society in their policy making, but also the judiciary needs to uh, stand up for the rights of the actually disempowered segments rather than getting into these uh, intra elite political fights. Right, intra-elite political fights, exactly. Danish, I wish we had more time and uh, we could uh, sort of go on and on, but I think we'll do a few follow-ups on this, picking up all your four particular uh, points and, uh, you know, expand them and talk about them. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for joining me and I hope the viewers would, will have certainly learned a lot as, as I have. Uh, so goodbye for now. Thank you.